I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Actually, I think I will just stand back a little bit. Is that all right? So I can, so I can see everybody. There's not that many of you, but uh, those who have made it, uh, I really appreciate that you uh, braved the rain on a Monday night to come down here and, and hear about the lost history of something that um, you probably don't know that much about. Now, before I begin, I'd like to just ask who in the room was at Habitat. I know of at least two and my mom <laughs> at the very back. Um, if you'll just indulge me, I will describe, uh, I'll explain Habitat and the conference and the history of the conference in more detail as the slideshow progresses. But uh, I would just like to give a personal introduction to my, my book research, why I got interested in Habitat, why I was interested enough to actually begin my research. I was at Habitat myself when I was uh, 12 years old, not just as an attendee, but actually as a volunteer on the site. Um, and it was a hugely formative event for me, uh, unbelievably formative um, experience in terms of my understanding of the city I lived in of the relationship of Vancouver to the rest of the world. And it sparked in my mind um, uh, a way of looking at, at cities and at my environment that I probably never would have, uh, never would have had access to without Habitat. So I'm just going to run through uh, a couple of slides. I want to situate the event at Jericho Beach. I think I'm just going to move back. I find it very hard not to be able to see you all. There we go. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, I, I want to... The, the interesting thing about this event is that, and from a Vancouver perspective, there are, there are two issues, really. One is the, the global event itself and its significance and its legacy. And the, the second thing is the, the significance of the site itself and its legacy, the, the situation of that conference in Vancouver. And it's a little bit difficult to weave those two things together. You've got, um, uh, you know, the, the significance, the, the, the very significant point that the, the, the conference that was held here in 1986 in Vancouver was the founding conference of a major UN agency, UN Habitat. And all of its, um, act, all of its subsequent activities worldwide but you also have the meaning that that event held for Vancouver, and I'm equally interested in both of those things. And one of, the, one of the reasons I think that this event is a lost event to Vancouver's history is something that Vancouverites don't really know that much about, except for those people who were there, is that the, the place that it took place was, is so heavily altered that we have lost our uh, landmarks, but, you know, the point of, of sort of a historical point of reference so that, uh, you know, you can't point, to, there's no, not a particular place or a building or anything that you can point to and say this is, where, this is where this very important event for Vancouver, this very important event in my own life took place. So I just want to start with a little bit of a tour of, of the site. Um, most of you probably recognize this site, or perhaps you don't, since it's really sort of just a, a parking lot and some chain link. But it's, it's Jericho Park, just a little bit, a few steps west, uh, sorry, east of the Jericho Sailing Center. Everybody probably recognizes that location. That's the sailing center itself. Uh, and throughout my life, every time I've, especially my adult life, post, post 12 years old, every time I've, I've uh, spent time down at this site or visited it to go down to the beach to, to, to go to an event, to maybe have dinner down at the cafe at the sailing center, it's always been a, an eerie experience. It's, it's it, like the experience, it sort of reminds me in some ways of those horror stories when somebody goes home to find that not only is their house not there, but the whole neighborhood's not there either, and, and it, it's just gravel, and you wonder if you're going a little bit crazy. There's, the, this is one of the few locations from the original conference that actually remains today. And, and oddly, over the decades, as I've... 
uh, gone down to this site, I, every time I go in, I always look hoping that there's maybe going to be a plaque or maybe a framed photograph or some remnant of, of habitat as it took place at Jericho. And, uh, and, and there never has been. Even the photographs I took of the site last year um, are different than, than it appears today. You may know that the, uh, these railings and this wharf at Jericho Beach uh, that it existed for the last, well, for many years, last 80 years, and, and these railings have been in that site for uh, 36 years, were removed as part of the ecological restoration of Jericho. And, you know, every time I go down there and, and look at this site, it's, it's uh, like a, I almost think of it as a tour of nothing. It's this, this odd, odd location where you can, you can tell in some ways by, by just looking at the layout of the park that something is missing. And I guess I'm curious also to know um, if, if other people actually feel that way about that park or if that's something that I'm projecting based on my own experience. But... It's an odd location. You get the sense that there was once something there and you're not quite sure what. There's odd little um, wedges of mown grass that don't seem to serve any purpose. Um, chain link fence, some strangely sort of oddly uh, plonked down tennis courts, two rugby pitches. But it's, it, it definitely has a no man's land quality about it. And yet... It, if you were there, and if you know what to look for, there are signs of the original history of the, of the place. This is the, the just east of the, the uh, sailing center, and it's the windsurfing um, paddleboard sailing um, compound where they keep the equipment in the Windshore Sailing School, the uh, windsurfing school. And it's almost like being a bit of an amateur um, archaeologist. When I was much younger, I would go down there and we would trace to try and find out where the buildings that we had, we had spent time in once were. And you can actually see the tracks in, in this photograph and in the subsequent one. Here, the ramp that uh, was in the, the, the photograph, two photographs before, that comes up from the water was one of the seaplane ramps. This was, this was a seaplane uh, military seaplane base, and the, one of the hangars that, in which hab Habitat took place was right here, right inside this compound. And this is one of the few places in the whole site where you can actually, where you actually get a sense that something existed before. That's under the wind, wind, windsurfing school, a post. But very little is left. What, what those of us who were there do have left are these mementos. And I've actually brought some here today. I don't have mine anymore. I had it for decades, but uh, eventually lost it in one of my many moves. Um, when I began to do this research, people began to come out of the woodwork, and my friend Gavin, who's now a filmmaker, uh, contacted me when he saw my website and said, oh my God, I was there too. It's so amazing to meet somebody else who was there and who actually remembers this. I have my original souvenir Habitat brand. Do you want it? which was very generous, and there it is, and I will give it back to him one day. And this is about all I had left, which is a commemorative coin that the city of Vancouver put out in, in collaboration with the Canadian Mint, and this was legal tender. It was a dollar coin, and it was legal tender in Vancouver during the um, span of the conference in June of 1976 for two weeks. That's what it looked like on the back. And uh, once upon a time, I had one of these as well, and I'm not sure where that went. And I, I somehow was able to find, uh, even though there's very little online, I was able to find this, this image of this original program. You probably have seen this before. This is a driftwood sculpture that is just to the, to the east between the rest of Jericho and, and this path at the end of the sailing center. It's a driftwood sculpture by a sculptor named Bernard Thor. And people probably pass by it without thinking about it very much. Apart from the sailing center, it's really the only other solid memento of that time. If you look very carefully, there's a plaque. And it reads, I don't know if you can read it. And I even have to come around. Habitat sculpture, the sculpture by Bernard Thor, commemorates the, uh, the United Nations Conference on Human Settlements Habitat Forum, 
not for non-governmental organizations held on this site at Jericho Beach Park, May 31st to June 11th, 1976. And then there's a, a little bit of a description. Can you read it? Everybody can read it? Okay. And there, it ends with this quote, a moment in time when people came together to think of their neighbors. Ironically, it was uh, installed by the Parks Board, and the irony of that will become clear as I, as I continue. But despite years of, of having this odd and I, I guess almost eerie and uncanny experience of this site, given that uh, something I felt that something momentous had happened there and all traces of it had been obliterated, I, I hadn't really thought of of delving into it. It seemed like one of those, you know, perhaps you begin to doubt your own interest in it. You begin to wonder, well, perhaps it was lost for a reason. Maybe it was an insignificant event. And uh, and I left it alone, but periodically I would go online and check to see if anything was there, perhaps a photograph, uh, uh, an article, and there never was. And over the years, that, that increasingly seems strange. And, you know, maybe once a year I would check to see if there was anything anything happening. And I didn't, it didn't really crystallize in my mind until the Olympics arrived. And in the, the run-up to the Olympics, there was a, a great amount of talk about Vancouver being finally on the world stage. And this ha there was a, some, something of a deja vu about that, because that's what they said when Habitat was planned in Vancouver in 1976. And it's also what was said, again, as if Habitat had never happened, in 1986 when Expo came. And uh, w when this happened again with the Olympics, I just thought, well, wait a minute, that's not true. We, uh, Vancouver hosted the largest ever United Nations conference in 1986 with thousands of delegates from all over the world, a, a really momentous event. And it's, it's, it's odd that we just keep forgetting this over and over. And, and as there was discussion during the Olympics of the fact that the uh, Olympics was, uh, you know, um, uh, this this mega event, and that there had been two mega events, Expo and, and 86, Expo 86 and the Olympics, there, there was not a single mention of Habitat. And I, I thought, you know, this is quite strange, because for those of us who were there, that was Vancouver's debut on the world scene. That was, uh, that was the momentous moment when, when, you know, we began to have a conversation globally and, and all eyes were turned to the city. So I... Uh, one day, uh, I went online and, and spent about three hours looking for something, and I came up with one thing. And it, oddly enough, it was an article in Common Ground magazine uh, that, that uh, mentioned the organizer of, of the event that took place at Jericho Beach, Al Clapp. And I thought, well, it was such a long time ago now, he, he probably isn't alive. But his phone number was listed, so w without really even any preparation or or thought, I picked up the phone, dialed it, and a man answered, and I, I said, can I please speak to Al Clapp? And he said, um, this is Al. And I said, oh, hi, I'm surprised to have reached you. I'm, I, uh, I just found your name online, and um, my name is Lindsay Brown, and I, I want to write a book on Habitat. And he said, uh, I've waited 34 years for this phone call, which was <laughs> really amazing. And, and he, was, he, he said, you know, I, I don't understand. I, I do understand, but I also don't understand the degree to which an event of this importance has been completely forgotten. Why don't you come to Victoria, and I'll give you all of my archive. So I, I, I did. Um, but over the last uh, couple of years of, of, of book research, I have spent a lot of time down at the Jericho site trying to resurrect a memory of, of, of what happened from my experience there, of course, it, it, seen through a 12-year-old's eyes, it's, you know, there's um, a lot you forget, and it's a, it, you, you, you have that particular childlike sort of skewed memory, and yet it's incredibly vivid in my mind. But when I, when I began to lead walking tours down at Jericho, uh, Jane's Walk and um, uh, other, uh, as part of an uh, um, other tour, walking tour series in the city, um, it's quite, I found it was quite difficult to lead a tour of nothing. So I started taking bags of dolomite chalk and just cutting off a corner and going down in advance and trying to draw out what I thought were the boundaries of the hangars that had existed uh, down at Jericho Beach. You can, and eventually, uh, after a while, I learned that you didn't need to draw in the whole thing. You could just do the corners. So um, I don't know if people have that map in front of them. Um, 
we have them we have them here so if you don't have one put your hand want one put your hand up because it will become uh, quite important later on to be able to know what I'm talking about because for those of you who know Jericho Beach it's it's uh, if I begin to try and describe where things are you you won't uh, you won't get it this is what Jericho looks like now. Um, this picture was actually taken in 82, but it's the, there's been very few changes ever since. So what I was starting to do was trying to figure out where things were. And, and in the, the prior picture, I was standing at the building of the three orange buildings that are close to the water, the, one that's, the thing that sticks out is a dock. Uh, it, I'm standing at the center one, which is Hangar 5. So I was, over the years I was trying to, last, last couple of years, I was trying to, f to put together a, a, a kind of a feeling for this place and a memory of what had happened and, and ground the research there. Um, and I just wanted to give you, before talking about the conference itself, which I can only do in a very rudimentary way because the, it, it was uh, a, f a, f a complicated and very fraught official conference as well as this People's Forum at Jericho. It's a, it's a huge topic, and I can't begin to cover it in, in any depth today. It's just going to be a, a short snapshot. But before we get into that, I just want to show you a few pictures of the site as it was in 1976, and then talk a little bit about the conference, and then give um, a, a, a kind of a, an overview of how the, the old uh, military hangars were refurbished, beautifully refurbished, and then turned into a beautiful conference site. So the next few photographs are give you an idea of what the site looked like at the time. So that, I didn't get this quite right, I did it from memory, but that's what the site looked like at top in 1976, and that's what it looks like now. And what you're seeing up there is one of the five hangars uh, decorated with a huge m m uh, mural purpose designed for that building by Bill Reed. And that's what it looked like during Habitat. Now, um, I'd like to apologize for the blurriness of some of these pictures. Some of, I don't have um, good photographic evidence of every angle, and some of the best angles actually came from CBC footage, which is what this is. So these are screenshots, so please forgive the blurriness. This particular audience was listening to Buckminster Fuller. That's taken from the other angle, so it's one of the big hangars on the, that, that was directly. So that is the actual location of that driftwood sculpture that still exists today, and that's how close it was to, um, uh, I believe, yeah, Hangar 5, if you look at your diagram. And this is just a number of views of the site. This is uh, the central plaza amid, amidst the two big hangars, 7 and 8, looking toward Hangar 3, which is the one that was decorated with the Bill Reed mural. Um, you'll probably recognize that. It's the mo recently demolished railing and um, apron wharf. And this is what it looked like just before Habitat, before the UN flags went up. And this is a Greenpeace launch a couple of weeks before, uh, actually a couple of months before Habitat took place in, in um, sometime in April of 76. These uh, w were uh, modern or late Art Deco uh, hangars left over from World War II. I'll talk more about them later. Looking the other way, that building at the top there um, in the sort of top center is the sailing center beyond. And then this is here is uh, Hangar 3. So d just a quick, I mean, this is not uh, um, an academic treatment of the conference by any means, but it's just a quick, um, quick and dirty description of, of the whole conference. The uh, conference, the idea for the conference actually came from a UN, um, UNEP, the, that is the UN Environmental Program, uh, massive conference that was held in Stockholm in 1972. And at that time, the, uh, public consciousness is, was grasping at the fact that we were in a, a population explosion. The, the um, effects on the environment were um, dire, and the UN had uh, come together and formed the, U, the UNEP agency in order to start to look at um, environmental problems on a global scale held the conference in 1972 in Stockholm, and at that time uh, Non-governmental organizations only had a kind of very peripheral status at the UN. This has changed, but 
these UN conferences were meant for, were private um, governmental uh, conferences meant for governmental delegates, you know, diplomats, um, uh, government officials, but were closed to the public. They were properly held UN meetings and they were trying to pass resolutions and form plans and policy to be implemented worldwide. But interestingly, at that 1972 conference in Stockholm, uh, Canadians had a, a quite vocal, and, and this is non-governmental um, visitors to the conference, gr members of Greenpeace, members of other non-governmental organizations descended upon Stockholm to try and um, pressure and make their presence felt and, and lobby um, the politicians inside the official conference to deal with certain environmental issues. And Greenpeace was there, so they were dealing with whaling, but they were also dealing with pollution issues um, uh, overfishing, um, land, all sorts of land use issues, and they set up a kind of a um, impromptu and I think to the conference probably alarming um, uh, temporary kind of encampment, um, sort of a protest encampment outside the. But it was it was entirely peaceful, but it was um, it was a new thing for the UN, and when it came time. One of the one of the um, upshots of that conference was that uh, people were realizing that to deal with environmental problems, you also have to deal with human problems. So things like the the biggest mass migration in history, which was the migration of people from rural areas into cities, was causing huge sort of settlements in cities, massive um, overpopulation of cities, um, impromptu you know slums and, and tenements. Um, dire problems in terms of you know delivering water to those people clean water disease problems and it was decided that there needed to be an adjunct to the environmental side and that that would be uh, uh, the a conference and a secretariat that dealt with settlement problems so um, they involved urban planners and um, health people involved in health and architects and anybody dealing with ecology in cities and uh, began to do research for a conference in 1976. Um, they didn't have a habitat, habitat, habitat uh, agency at that time. It was just a secretariat and it was entirely set up to do a conference. Because of the, the um, strong participation of Canada at the Stockholm conference, both in, in the governmental side and in the sort of agitational side outside, in the informal forum, people's forum, um, it was decided that Canada would host the 1976 uh, Habitat conference. And so what you had was a um, and they had the idea that perhaps they should almost institutionalize the forum element, give non-governmental organizations, particularly considering that the Canadians had brought so much non-governmental activity to um, to Stockholm, that, that what they should do is actually sponsor a people's forum that would be free, that would be open, and, and everybody could attend, and that it would give a chance for um, non-governmental organizations to actually exhibit, make speeches, and and um, and contribute and talk. So I've just included this to show that the original logo for the conference, the the logo that's now the UN agency, UN Habitats logo, is the uh, Vancouver Conference logo, which is the the circle in the middle with the UN uh, laurels, and that's the motto of, of UN Habitat. So it was born in Vancouver. And I went last year to the General Assembly in New York and actually got to meet the heads of the UN Habitat there. And, and I, one of the questions I had for them is, do you, does anybody at UN Habitat actually remember the Vancouver Conference? And I, I thought maybe that the answer would be no. And they sort of looked at me in surprise and said, well, of course, that's, we, we just call it you know, Vancouver. That's our founding document. That's what we refer to it as. So at the official conference in 1976 in Vancouver, the, the um, resolution that was passed, not unanimously, but, um, but the, one, the one that was written and presented for the conference is known as the Vancouver Declaration. It is the founding document of UN Habitat. And um, it's an amazing document. It's, you can read it if you go to my website. It's online. Um, and there's a link on the links page. It's about 50 pages. You can print it out. And it's, it, it's a, a fascinating 
statement in favor of equitable, equitable distribution of wealth and services in the world's growing cities. It's so obvious that in 1976 it was, it was clear to them that the population of the world would double by today as it, as it in fact has and that the uh, very quickly, it hadn't yet happened, but that very quickly more people on the planet would be living in cities than in, in rural areas. So I'm going to start to quickly go through some of this. One of the interesting things about Habitat is the sheer sort of intellectual firepower of, of uh, women economists and sociologists and anthropologists added. It's, uh, it, it struck me quite late, but the founding genius behind both the Stockholm Conference and the Vancouver Conference was Barbara Ward, a top um, British economist who spent a lot of time working for the UN, um, uh, worked, had a, has an honorary degree from Harvard, worked in Cambridge, um, was an advisor to JFK, a, a, a really important figure. It's really odd that she is so little known today. And uh, I, I feel as strongly about um, sort of resurrecting her reputation as, as, the, as resurrecting the history of, of Habitat. Really interesting person. She, she came to Vancouver and she wrote, a, she, she actually had been involved in Canada uh, quite a lot earlier. She gave a Massey lecture in 1961 um, and they made a book out of it. It's called The Rich Nations and the Poor Nations. And she was really talking about the fact that the human fu future could only be uh, assured and stable and peaceful if uh, wealth was distributed properly. It was the only way to both protect the environment and to protect life in the cities. And so she really is the, was the driving intellectual force b b behind both conferences. And she attended in Vancouver in 1976, both the official delegation conference and the Habitat Forum at Jericho. Now, I'm going to show you some, um, and <laughs> I think you'll find them quite funny and maybe a, a little bit dated, um, but I want to show you some um, CBC news clips of the official conference before going back and talking about Habitat Forum. I'm more interested in Habitat Forum because in many ways, and you can see that from these clips, more interesting things happened at Jericho in the free public and NGO forum than happened downtown. And one of the reasons for that is that, like, as with most UN conferences, and there's a certain amount of deja vu, I think, uh, with, for me, looking back at everything that happened in 1976, because so much of it, I mean, the hairdos are different and some of the clothes are different, but all of the rest of it is unbelievably familiar, the talk of environmental problems, the talk of the distribution of, of wealth, and... Here we have the official conference, which, as you can see, is held at the Queen Elizabeth Theatre, which they've decorated for uh, in, in the UN colors, in the UN blue with the UN logo and the new Habitat logo. Um, that that uh, conference was entirely hijacked by, and I don't mean hijacked in a bad way, but it was, uh, it sort of um, got shipwrecked on the rocks of the Israel PLO question, which in w many ways makes sense because the topic of the, co the, the conference was settlements. And, you know, it wasn't that long after the Six State War, um, the PLO, which was there as um, with an observer status only, felt that the question of settlements was quite pressing in, the, in, in their case. And the conference almost didn't happen in Vancouver because local authorities, despite the fact that the feds had already said yes to it, didn't like or said that they didn't like the idea that the PLO would be in Vancouver. And because of what had happened at the Munich Olympics in 1972 with the shootings, they people were um, perhaps understandably jittery, although the politics, um, there were other and much more political reasons for the, um, the city trying to stop the conference from happening in Vancouver. But I'll, I'll um, stop talking and just play this cl the next clip. The general has um, just been on a northern tour, has been traveling around quite a lot recently, having uh, recovered uh, from a stroke. There you have Trudeau. Just after his investiture into the office of uh, Governor um, General. Kurt Waldheim, the I Secretary would think, Lloyd, that, uh, General of the UN. thinking about housing after his trip to the north because this is one area where Canada is very vulnerable in its own uh, housing image around the world. And uh, we see Prime Minister Trudeau. Well, this is CBC oh, North. I'm really the general sorry. General has I'm gonna um, just been on a northern tour, has been traveling around quite Sorry a lot about that. recently, Replay. having uh, recovered uh, from a stroke a few years ago, just after his investiture into the office of uh, Governor General. I would think, Lloyd, that uh, he will be thinking about housing after his trip to the north, because this is one area where Canada is very vulnerable in its own uh, housing image around the world. 
And uh, we see Prime Minister Trudeau there, and he is also just back from some of the more remote areas of Canada, some of the Indian villages in uh, the Queen Charlotte Islands. And certainly we have nothing to be proud of in our housing reputation there either. Just to the right of uh, the picture there, beside the Prime Minister, he's now just stepped out of our frame, as a matter of fact, uh, Enrique Peñalosa, who is the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations Habitat Conference. They're forming up outside the Queen Elizabeth Theatre uh, for the entrance uh, to the theatre itself, and when they get inside, the formal program will begin. Just one more clip. This is CBC North. Mr. Chips will not be seen tonight, and other programs have been cancelled or rescheduled so that we may present the following CBC News special. Skyline City there. Good evening, I'm Lloyd Robertson. The largest United Nations conference in history entered its final stages as a forum for bitter political squabbling. The Habitat Conference here in Vancouver, called to work out some kind of international order for human settlements, did pass resolutions on land use and water use. But the 4,500 delegates from around the world were split sharply yet again over Israel. The conference, attended by the Palestine Liberation Organization, failed to pass its Declaration of Principles unanimously, principles that included the right of all people to live in human dignity. I just kept the uh, Mr. Chips part at the beginning, so I thought that would be nostalgic for some of us who are old enough to remember it. Um, there was one other, before I get to the Habitat Forum section, there was one other element of Habitat that people may not know about. I know that Trevor will remember it. As he, uh, Trevor Bode, who's our um, architecture, one of our architecture critics in the city, who will probably remember this. I don't know who else will, but maybe my mom there at the back. Um, this was, obviously is now the Vancouver Art Gallery, but was at the time still the courthouse. And what you have, it's a bit hard to see, and there are very few good photographs of this, but that's Georgia Street down there at the bottom. You can see the fountain in the center, and these um, two huge pavilions on either side with a crenellated roof, uh, and I'll show you what they look like from the inside, were designed by Arthur Erickson for Habitat. Uh, it was a commission from the Habitat Secretariat, and his idea was that uh, since there was an environmental and ecological theme for habitat, what he'd like to do is entirely uh, make these pavilions entirely out of recycled materials. But the real brainwave was that he involved school children from all over the Lower Mainland. And this is one way that they, they drew people into in, in the Lower Mainland to sort of a sense of involvement. And p if you talk to those kids today, for example, a friend of mine, Robert Studer, has become an internationally known designer from Vancouver, um, told me that his career was, was begun when he made one of these panels. But each one of these little panels and flags was made entirely from old newspaper, uh, coated with a um, non-toxic, waterproof glue by his k school kids in school, and then they were all brought to the site and assembled. The rods that uh, form the structure are paper tubes. And for those of you who know architecture, it, it may remind you of um, Shigeru Ban, the Japanese architect who has done very similar work, uh, but much later, um, producing paper, very much like this actually, paper structures, often for use as disaster architecture to house people in camps after natural disasters. So this was quite groundbreaking. It was the information center. So it was sort of halfway between, well, not halfway, but it was near the, near the Queenie. It's where the, uh, public information was disseminated. It was where they ran shuttles from this point at the courthouse down to the, uh, a little ferry dock, kind of where we have the sea bus now, where a little, and ferries would, both shuttles would leave by, by road and the ferries would leave that would then take passengers all the way over to Jericho Beach. So the, um, 
Oddly, this had a really profound effect on most of the school children who took part in it. It was a beautiful structure. There was a huge amount of debate over what it cost. And I think halfway through, instead of being $600,000, it was cut in half to 300000 But it was still a, a quite um, impressive structure. That's the model. So it gives you a better sense of what it, what it actually looked like. And finally, the forum. Now, this is very 1976. <laughs> <laughs> and much of what took place at the forum had this sort of post-hippie, funky 70s quality. Um, there was a bit of a war down there in terms of aesthetics. Or so, um, many actually very good architects today worked on it, uh, on the site, and uh, they imposed a certain amount of uh, minimalism, but there was a certain amount of this as well. So um, the official conference cost $15 million, which was considered a huge amount at the time. The forum was uh, just under a million, but it was done with almost nothing. Um, and what I want to do now is, is talk about some of the people who, who uh, appeared at Habitat, because I think this is something people have no idea about. They, when I say to people, when I, when I list off the names of the sort of important international figures in architecture and um, and housing issues and health issues, uh, they're always really surprised. So I just want to do a quick inventory of who was there. There are a couple of video clips um, and some just some interesting archival material. It was interesting that Alan Fotheringham, who was a columnist at the time, uh, I think it's fair to say a grumpy curmudgeon, and this is a, a just a... a He's, he's gushing over the intelligence and, and, I think, wit of Barbara Ward on her visit to Vancouver. Um, I, you will see Barbara Ward here. We're brought into focus during the past two weeks at Habitat Forum, which was a parallel kind of conference run by non-governmental representatives and not by officials. When the forum opened That's a little Art over Phillips two weeks on the ago, the mayor. all the officials stood around grinning. They were pleased. They all praised the project. They had high hopes. Here was a real forum where the people, not just the politicians, would convene. And a dialogue would really take place. Bear in mind that you're not, it's not us talking to you, but it's all of us thinking about the problems of Habitat together. And if we can have this kind of relationship and if this kind of uh, understanding, then perhaps we can all help each other. It's quite the accent. <laughs> but it gave you a sense of what it looked like um, on the site. That must have been a particularly cold day, a typical June day when you have um, people wearing wool coats inside. Trudeau, obviously. Um, was a huge supporter of the project. It would not have happened without him. He was insistent that Habitat Forum would happen and would be properly funded. And it was actually funded with work grants, $900,000 of LIP grants, which were called, um, well, actually, it was a, various federal programs and local initiative projects, as they were called. And that's the only reason it was able to be done on that amount of money. Um, and they, what they were able to do was, thanks to the money that, that Trudeau put in, was able to hire um, uh, unemployed. It was like a work grant program. That's um, Maggie Trudeau with her back to the camera, and that's Justin Trudeau on top, and um, Pierre, and probably, I, I don't know which of the other sons. So this gives you a sense of, of and also how freely people moved on the site. Um, probably something that wouldn't happen now. I don't know if it couldn't, but it probably wouldn't happen that um, that everybody mixed together. It was one of the really, and I, I remember seeing this, I remember being down there as a kid and seeing Margaret Mead just walk by and thinking how, how amazing that was. It, it really had a completely public, open, free quality that was quite striking and very different from other m massive events that have taken place in the city. Just a few more pictures of, of Trudeau. That's Al Clapp on the left. He was not the f um, organizer of the entire forum and its content, but he was the, the, the person who orchestrated the refurbishment of the old military hangars uh, into a proper convention site. It w they had five and a half months to do it. Uh, he had to, but I'll talk a little bit more about him later. Um, quite a, it was quite a feat. Uh, requiring a certain amount of um, exertion of power, which made him somewhat unpopular. Again, that's Al Clapp with Trudeau. The general has um, 
just been on a northern tour. We've seen that already. Now, the uh, Secretary General, and we were supposed to have a lot of planning students here tonight who unfortunately have been, it's been made mandatory for them to go to the uh, community um, meeting for the changing of Robson Street over to, uh, or potentially changing Robson Street over to a pedestrian um, zone, and so they're not here. I, but I put this in partly for them. Um, Enrique Peñalosa, that's the one there in the hat, uh, was the uh, Secretary General, UN Secretary General for the conference, not the Secretary General of the UN, but the, but the head of the conference, a really interesting man, probably one of the best urban planners ever um, to take a city and do something really amazing with it. He was the mayor of Bogota in Colombia. His son also went on to, to um, be a, a brilliant um, urban planner and, and city leader. And what the, what they did, what he did at this conference was, I mean, he, he brought it together in a very interesting way. But he was also a uh, an interesting man, uh, unpretentious, um, uh, a great addition to the forum site. And there was one day when he, he actually spent quite a lot of time at the forum, which some of the people working at the downtown conference didn't entirely appreciate. Uh, but he liked the open atmosphere of the forum and I think recognized that things were happening there and really important discussions were being held at the forum that were not being held downtown and he spent a fair amount of time there. And there was one day when they tried to whisk him away onto an official tour of the city and he said, no, I actually, I actually don't want to do that. I want a tour of the harbor on the Greenpeace boat. So he went out with the Greenpeace captain. Um, the, he was a little bit hard to rule, I think, but, um, but uh, uh, a really interesting figure. That's him talking about uh, housing, wh th what was wrong with housing policy in, in th um, third world cities, which is one of the main um, focuses of, of the conference. It was about urban planning, but it was very much, very much had a focus on th the, the difficulty of influxes into um, cities, massive cities in the developing world. So he was an obvious choice. Another photograph of him, Enrique on the left. And Mother Teresa who uh, was, uh, opened the portion of the conference that was um, uh, directed at, uh, particular, at, at the poor, but particularly at the uh, handicapped. And so she was, she was uh, considered the ambassador to the conference for um, the handicapped. I think they were just saying crippled then. Um, but she, um, she gave a, an address that was extremely uh, well attended, standing room only address, which some people in the room may remember if they were uh, there, I don't know. If any of the ones in the room, if either of you actually were at that, were at that event. Um, yesterday, somebody contacted me to say that he was there and that um, he had a photograph of Mother Teresa addressing the room and, and he wanted to give it to me and that's what that framed photograph at the front is. So it gives you a sense of the crowds. Margaret Mead, unbelievably, the CBC spelt her name wrong. <laughs> so uh, ignore the E at the end. Um, she was a, a brilliant uh, speaker at the conference. I've, at the, the more um, archive I uncover, the, the more fascinating film clips I'm finding of her. She spoke on a number of topics, anything from uh, nuclear um, testing. She was very much against nuclear power, but she, she also berated the, the audience at the, in the forum at the NGOs because she, people had begun to quibble about the wording of the Vancouver Declaration, and her view was that it, the document was so important that it was not a time for discussion, it was a time for ratification. But she began her speech in, in the main plenary hall at Habitat by, by saying, I'm ashamed of you, but every, um, nobody was... Um, she was joking and everybody laughed, but she was, but she was being deadly serious. Um, she was a, a very much an important part of the conference. And there she is actually in performance, um, cultural performance. She uh, did a lot of impromptu, very cooperative and, and game and, and got herself involved in, in lots of cultural performances. And there she is with Margaret Trudeau, who was very, very active at the conference. She was down at the, the um, Habitat site every day at the forum site and spoke on a number of topics. I love these photographs again. There's, these are screenshots. I really apologize for the blurriness. Uh, she, I just love that she was dressed almost as a boy scout. There she is up on the uh, quite a rough cedar platform that was in the center of the five, um, 
as, as Trevor and uh, other friend here would, will remember, it was in the center of the, the uh, five hangars. It was an outdoor stage where many, I mean, a very, very simple, very humble stage w that ended up being um, a, a kind of an almost more informal place for people to speak. And, and even though some of these major figures spoke to huge audiences inside the plenary hall, which is a, a massive space, many of them um, actually came and gave much more informal speeches uh, out here too. Um, this is a terrible screenshot, I'm sorry, but the, uh, some of the footage that I got from the, the very cooperative CBC Vancouver archives, but some of it is, on, is very, very low res, so my apologies. That is Maggie Trudeau interviewing Buckminster Fuller in these amazing chairs in the CBC, uh, in the CBC studio. Uh, and, and of you'll see more here. People like Buckminster Fuller, inventor of the geodesic dome. Mr. Fuller talked about alternate housing with Take 30 special interviewer Margaret Trudeau. Dr. Fuller, we've been able to listen to your words at Habitat, and we've, uh, as Canadians, uh, as world people, I don't like to to think of borders anymore, but as world people, we're watching very seriously Habitat Forum, those of us who are concerned about the future of our, our planet, to find solutions to the problems of human settlements, of environment, of, of housing, uh, in a real terms, like a young couple who's committed themselves to changing their, their way of, of living because we feel we, in order to survive, we have to change. What are your suggestions? How, what's a blueprint for us to go out and, and uh, make necessary changes in our environment to, to help this revolution? Mm. Well, you really have said already what I personally committed to for about the last half century, which was not trying to solve problems by reforming people and laws. And we have a really tendency in, in, a, in coming to a meeting like this with all the delegates of all the governments mm. to really be coping with political reforms, mm. how, 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 what you prevent people doing, what you allow them to do. But personally, I became absolutely committed to what I call reforming the environment instead of trying to reform the people. Because when I began to think about 1950, uh, 1927, what can the little individual, absolutely less unknown, mm -hmm. What can he do on behalf of humanity in an effective manner mm -hmm. in his little lifetime without any money and everything, start without any money, if anything? And I said, well, number one, I've learned, I've listened to a great many people trying to persuade other people to do this and that, and they never get anywhere. So I'm never going to talk to anybody anymore unless they ask me to talk to them. Yes. And I'm, I'm going to commit myself entirely to the fact that I see that nature is always changing. Mm. The Rain is eroding the hillside. Mm -hmm. Evolution is always at work. Things are always changing their shape. And so I, I see that if I were to build a bridge across a roaring gorge instead of people trying to swim across and get lost, they would use the bridge. You wouldn't have to ask them to use the bridge. They'd automatically they use the bridge. Yeah. So I made up my mind then to develop then artifacts and nothing else. Artifacts. And yeah, that brought me into looking at, for instance, the environment controls. What do, what do people really need that really does keep the rain off, but also conserves the rain so they can have, have it to drink when, when they want it, whatever mm -hmm. it may be. And so I've been working in these artifacts for many, many years. And one of the things that impressed me was that they're doing more with less, of course. Mm -hmm. So the more successful you are, the, the really the less there is to see. Yes. <laughs> and I think they're really, yes, that's true. The fi finally, a great architect will be an architect who, a man named Lundberg Holm once told me, the great architect will be the man who produces the building couldn't see at all. Uh -huh. He does so much with so much little. Yeah. And I think if we go with all this great set of delegates from all the countries around the world, enormous amount of meeting that's gone on in the different countries around the world getting ready for it. It's been great organization, great dedication, there's no question about that. But then there are a lot of little human beings completely independently, finding there was some space here at Jericho Beach and up the hillside above, above the, the forum hangars mm -hmm. where they could uh, install something. You go over there and see some really right, tiny little, little domes and this and that domes, and windmills. Yes. But they're superbly, mm -hmm. uh, they're superb manifestations. Of little people, there's no big corporation doing it for no. them or anything. No. Yes. And then uh, they have all the kinds of equipment that young people want about really handling information. 
has his own printing press. They can print their own newspaper over there. That was a little long, but I just wanted you to get, get a sense of, of him and his eccentric delivery. <laughs> um, there's a picture of him on, as you can see, on the, the uh, informal stage out in, with some of his um, geodesic sculptures there on a table, just talking to the crowd. And that was one of the amazing things is the, how close he would be, I mean, how, how informal it was. Len and Joanne Greisman are not politicians. He's an architect, she's concerned with housing problems, and they flew here from Winnipeg to attend some of the speeches and workshops. Basically, I'm here just for the um, exposure. Uh, there's a lot happening, just as my wife mentioned, uh, a lot of people here with uh, ideas about uh, human settlement problems, and it's basically an education for myself. Education and exposure to ideas. That's what they came for, and that's what those who cared to listen certainly got. For example, Buckminster Fuller on energy abuse. The evidence is incontrovertible that within 10 years we can be living on an energy income. Everybody knows you ought to live on the income and not on the savings account. Certainly not by burning up the ship. <laughs> I don't know if you could hear that. Um, and then I'm just going to quickly whip through some slides of some of the people who are there. This was the MP, um, the, the, uh, in the um, Minister of Urban Affairs, Barney Danson, who was directly reported to Trudeau for this. He was the president of the conference. Um, new Premier Bill Bennett, who had taken over from uh, Dave Barrett. Uh, Dave Barrett had actually been very helpful in the run-up to Habitat, but lost the election in November of 75. So uh, Bill Bennett was... Uh, fresh, uh, and you can see here that the Bill Reed mural had not even been painted yet, so he's visiting the site before it was complete. And there's a, a video I, I may interrupt halfway through because we're running out of time, but it shows it shows what the beautiful covered walkways on the site look like. That's Al Clapp taking Bill Bennett through, and uh, the these walkways, these covered walkways, were built between the hangars because they expected rain. Not surprisingly, and to, and to sort of connect them aesthetically. Habitat Forum, which belongs to the people, is a good adjunct to the UN and government-sponsored Habitat Conference taking place uptown. I'm, I'm impressed with what our people have done, and I think everyone in British Columbia, given the opportunity, should come and visit Habitat Forum. Um, and then, of course, delegates from all over the world, some of whom have gone, uh, went back from Habitat and became very important um, housing and, and settlement advocates in their home countries, partly because one of the best things about the conference was a, a techni um, technical assistance program in which um, uh, the UN paid for and paid for the training for a, uh, each country to produce an AV uh, presentation, usually a film, on, on either on film or video, and uh, bring that to Habitat. So what it did was um, what they, what they would hire somebody and then train them to produce a film on a topic that was uh, considered of urgent importance in terms of appropriate technology. So a, an appropriate technology would be technology, sort of ecological um, technology affordable by a settlement. So it might have to do with water standpipes or w water filtration or solar panels or um, passive solar houses, things like that. And those films, um, including one by this guy, w were taken back um, to those countries. And from what I heard from people in the UN, some of those films were still in use 20 years later. So they were informational and, and in many cases instructional. Just a, a sample of, of one of the documents that was produced. There's a, a sort of quite massive archive of these. This is before UN Habitat actually existed, so it refers to the Habitat Conference Secretariat. So now I just want to give you a quick history of the site because I think this is the, this is the second big point. It's not just that um, not just that a, that uh, a big conference took place there, and that's part of its history. But the history of this site actually goes back further. And I think pro pe many people in the room probably know this already. There's been a, a very good book published on the military history of the Jericho site. It actually goes back to the 1860s when it was a royal admiralty. Um, so it was a, a actually a combination, not really army or, or navy or, or air force, but a, a sort of a federal um, 
combination military base. Not much was done with the land until 1920. In fact, there was a uh, the reason it's called Jericho is that a, a guy had a contract for Hastings Mill to to um, bring them wood, and he just without he, he was really basically squatting on the land. His name was Jerry. He, he called himself Jerry and Co. The guys at the Hastings Mill just called him called him Jericho, uh, so Jerry Co. So that's how we that's how that uh, beach got its name. But uh, and uh, West Siders were playing golf down there. They'd made a golf course, but by 1920. Um, the the it, because of World War One and returning flyers from World War One, um, the five hangars were built. Actually, six hangars were built, and it became a seaplane base. They were called flying boats in those days. And that's just a view of the site, uh, comparison view today. And uh, that was actually 1976. So this is what it looked like. Originally, this would have been around World War Two. You can actually see the seaplanes there. And you don't see all the ramps yet. That, in fact, the apron went the whole way around. Um, but there's just the one ramp in the center. Uh, so that's a, a really old photograph. But it gives you a sense of the placements, pretty much the same as today. These were rebuilt at one point. But the hangars that existed in 1976 were World War II, were the World War II version. There's another photograph with, with only the five remaining, not the six. Photograph was in 1972, just before Habitat. That's from the city archives. And there are some buildings left from that era. The hostel, as you probably know, and the Abertau, and the, sail the uh, current day sailing center. This plaque is on the hostel, if you've ever gone up to the door. That just uh, replays that history. And there are a number of plaques down there, so uh, some people are aware. There are... Um, number of these photographs in the book, which if, which if you're interested is just called Jericho Beach and the West Coast Flying Boat Stations. By the 60s, the, uh, built, the hangars had been abandoned. The um, flying boat station had, was no longer in use. It wasn't just military. It operated for, uh, for several decades, doing things like surveying, um, doing things for the, the, um, at the provincial level. The um, provincial government used it for, for surveying and transport uh, of various kinds. They had contracted the base out to seaplanes that were actually taking people in before roads were built, taking into um, mining and forest, mi uh, forestry cut blocks and mining sites. So it had a long history in, in both the military and industry and government by the 60s when it was falling into disuse. And there began to be talk of the feds handing the money over, uh, handing the land over to the provincial government. And then the provincial government began to talk in the 60s about handing it over to the city. And that happened in 1967 uh, to, the, to the parks board. There were parks on either side of it. So when the land came back from the military, it then became a continuous park. This is Al Clapp. Uh, at the beginning, at the very beginning, was hired to take this, and he had been agitating for it, so he did play a role in trying to bring Habitat to Jericho. That was partly his idea, and his idea, he, he was very much involved with the people who had also helped to save, and it, and it was a movement across the city, to save older industrial buildings and put them to public and community use. Granville Island is a very good example of this. Um, a federal initiative, which is probably why it happened, my opinion. But um, so Al had wanted to, he had been floating the idea of using those hangars for public events for quite a long time. He had enough pull in the city because he'd been a BCTV newsman. He told me that he had the first hour-long news show in North America on TV. I don't know if that's uh, true, and I may be getting that a bit wrong, but he was a very well-known figure with a lot of contacts being in the press. Uh, he was 42 at the time, um, pretty experienced, and I think it's fair to say bullheaded enough to put this through. They had very little time. There had, there had been a lot of delay, and he had five and a half months to get these quite... Dec they were actually in, in great shape, but they were empty, cold um, military hangars that needed to be turned into comfortable con um, conference space. And his idea in... in um, you know, consistent with the, the 
the theme of the conference, he wanted to do it ecologically. So he wanted to do the entire thing with recycled materials, almost succeeded. Had they had a bit more money, they probably would have been able to do it. But uh, what he did was amass a crew of architects, artisans, um, work grant people from these LIP and other grants, and uh, ex-cons, juvenile delinquents, school kids. This is a ragtag army of just under 11,000 people, and he took the site and made it into a really beautiful conference center in five months. So this is his diagram. This was his original plan, which they, they pretty much stuck to. Um, one of the, the, the person who actually conceived of the aesthetics of it was someone who dropped out fairly early, but quite a visionary guy named Mo Van Nostrand. There's the map that you have, just so you can get a sense of it. I'm just gonna play this short. The old clip. hangers are now long gone, replaced by grass and bushes and a tennis court, but not much else. But 16 years ago, this was the site of the bustling Habitat Forum, uh, the, the an event created by Al we Clapp and the talents of scores of local artists. Al, what sort of memories do you have when you come down to this location now? Oh, nothing but the fondest of memories, Terry. Uh, it was an incredible group of people that put Habitat Forum together. It was just a joy to, to do the work and to organize and pull it together. Well, that's just going to put the magic in it. There are people, I would say, who are like a shadow workforce, people who have not had regular employment but are craftsmen, been working, you know, in their own little shops, whatever. A lot of, a number of people have actually quit high-paying jobs in order to come down and work uh, on this site and put it together. Incredible indeed. Early critics, such as the City and the Parks Board, doubted that it could be done. But it was done. The federal government kicked in $1 million for Habitat Forum. That was a piddling amount compared to the $15 million it spent on the official meeting downtown. There, the well-dressed delegates talked about the world's poor people, basically how to give them shelter. What about Canada taking in a few more immigrants? We have a moral responsibility, and I think it's politically right for Canada and for the world to increase the immigration. The rate of flow itself, I suppose, is something which is not amenable to precise uh, philosophical prescriptions. There's no point um, increase immig in increasing immigration at a rate which would uh, create uh, great unemployment of even the immigrates, immigration, immigrants themselves. Back at Jericho, the Prime Minister's wife was drawing an even bigger crowd. They followed and Margaret the Trudeau everywhere. Uh, everyone's got their words, uh, their concepts, their theories, their principles, their values, all of those things that they're weaving around in magical circles for all of us to trip on. But really, what we want is commitment. We want action and we want not promises. It's debatable whether the downtown version of Habitat ever provided a stick of housing for the world's poor people. But Habitat Forum did generate some beneficial spin-offs. One more quick clip. Taking the sound off this section, it's a bit of a, a flash forward. But the next section deals with... Last the winter, South. politics and financial tangles had paralyzed any progress, and the future of the Forum was in doubt. He gathered together a band of not so many, but hard-working people, and began to build. For $900,000, some old empty airplane hangars were slicked up, revamped, and remodeled. Over the months, the wooden shapes took form, until finally, Forum happened. Those who rarely get to the palaces or parliaments or plenaries of governments finally had a place of their own. And the place got a lot of visitors. Downtown had the official conference. But it was the forum across the water that seemed to get the attention. It was as if Vancouver had just added a new tourist attraction to its list. There was Gastown, Stanley Park, Kitsilano, and now Jericho Beach where the forum was held.
Okay, I'm not going to play too many more clips, but this one is uh, really good. It's Al Clapp talking about the use of the five hangers. If you've got several different hangers here, could you describe the concept behind each one of them? Well, the two front, the two back hangers, as I call the two wooden ones, which are hangers number seven and eight. Seven is like a social center. That's where our uh, bar is, where the food is, where entertainment takes place. And then number eight is a uh, display center for political groups groups, environmental groups, uh, and it's more the social aspect of it. The front three hangers, three, five, and six, are where the political discussions take place. So we've sort of drawn a line between the, the two sets of hangers. The front three, which face the water, is where the politics happen. The back is where the people come to visit. That jacket. Decide. Things for the ordinary citizen who's not interested probably in the politics of it. would like to come down and see the site, would like to come down and see what's happening. That's what the back hangers are for. You've been using uh, recycled materials for a lot of things. Well, we would like to have used a lot more recycled materials. We, uh, the, um, our concept was, was saying that there's enough materials inside and around Vancouver to more than do the kind of work that we have to do here. But unfortunately, the money was laid in coming to us, and every time the longer to get the money to pay wages, the less recycling that we could use. And that was my one major disappointment that we weren't able to use enough. But I think we proved one point very strong. And that was the logs on the beaches of British Columbia. A long time ago before the white man came. He's talking about salvaged wood, and uh, they weren't able to make everything out of salvaged wood, but they did a huge amount of milling. Both of, they had donations from um, uh, uh, Lignum Corporation, but they also did salvage a huge amount of logs off the beach. These are the railings of the the Lionsgate Bridge that uh, were brought in. It was actually arranged before um, Dave Barrett was out of office, and he offered them to Al and sent them over. Was a, a huge amount of um, sort of ex-con welders took the <laughs> took the the long spurs that had kept those on that had uh, attached those to the bridge took them off and then ran those all the way around the hangar aprons so that it had a, a safe railing and i'm going to go quickly through these pictures they're they're just shots of the assembly the the refurbishing of the hangars and uh, if you have any questions just uh, shout out some of the, the wood this is some of the donated wood not salvaged wood arriving Gives you a sense of the scale of these buildings. If you if you think of the sailing center today, it's pretty. It seems quite substantial. The it is dwarfed by the size of these hangars. Raising the poles. This is for the walkways around the hangars. Um, just to reorient yourself again, the, the location of the hangars, and that's what they look like. So the one on the far left there is the one that got the Bill Reed mural. And then these two matching ones are the ones that were always used for the, the Greenpeace launch. So they have the beautiful, modern, um, sort of carved column fronts that face the water. And then this is just sort of a pan across the site. It's also taken from CBC footage. So you see the sailing center there on the left. Um, that's a covered walkway being built from the gate on. And then this is between two of the hangars, some of the um, cedar-covered walkways. Uh, sort of a portico around the buildings. And then this is the size of some of the logs that they were able to that both have donated and, and salvaged. You can see that uh, the building that had the mural on it, uh, that's Hangar 3, is the one that was used as a workshop. And they set the mill up there, the, produced an absolute mountain of sawdust. And what was really nice about the site when you were there, and it was very vivid for me as a child, was the smell of cedar. The whole place was perfumed. Um, and lots of people I've interviewed say that's one of their main memories of it. Just gorgeous. And of course, these are t um, thick timbers that they used for the, the almost Jenga-like seating in the, in the plenary halls, and one of the main uses of the, the lumber. And the person who designed that was um, quite a still quite celebrated art, um, architect in Vancouver, Mark Osborne, who works uh, more out, outside, in you know, out, outlying areas of Vancouver and on islands, building houses. Uh, he designed that, and they used these very beautiful, thick um, cuts of lumber, some of the crew. Trained, um, trained artisans, uh, tradesmen, volunteers. 
the size of some of the wood that they had. This, these giant logs were became the um, almost sort of um, Shinto Shinto like gate, but there was also meant to be sort of a um, a longhouse reference. You see the front gate there, Alclat moving chairs. That's the entire, the main crew, obviously not all the volunteers, since there were thousands upon thousands of them, but that was the, the core crew who had worked together before Habitat on other projects as well. That's Al sitting down there with the big white collar. And then this is an interesting one, because that at the far left is Mike Harcourt, who was uh, designated by the city to be on the board of... Um, the organization that actually hired Al Clapp and was in charge of refurbishing the site, ACSOH, and, and, and uh, Harcourt was an alderman at the time and he was appointed to that board to oversee, so he was often down at the site. I, Al told me he wasn't supposed to be on there since he hadn't done any of the work, but he snuck into the photograph anyway in his bow tie. Just pictures of the, the site. Some of the painting, and so now we're just going to start to see the completion of some of the hangers, and I'm just going to go one by one. This is what it looked like to work on the work on the Bill Reed mural, which they Bill um, made a drawing of about that size, and then they on a crane projected it, outlined it, and then painted it in. This was the moment they finished it. Um, I think that's Anne Medina who produced some of the most scathing videos. You probably caught that tone in some of those clips. She did not think much of Habitat Forum or of the conference in general. It's quite funny to go over the, and it, but her, uh, her assessment of it is far more negative than, uh, than I get from most of the people um, I've interviewed. But it's uh, the only reason I'm showing that is you can see the Bill Reed mural up there uh, at the back. You get a sense of how, how the hangars were situated on the, uh, in the park and on the beach, close up, and what it looked like to go in the front gate. It's a blurry screenshot, sorry about that one. But some of these angles um, I don't have actual photographs for, so the, the uh, screenshots are useful. It gives you also a sense of um, many of the photographs I have, uh, the still photographs, um, they seem to want to wait until people were off the site, so you don't get a sense of the sheer crowds that, that visited. And I think I'm just showing uh, many of these photographs because I'm in love with that building and was in love with it at that age, and I think I, I'm still um, mortified and, um, that it's gone. That's from an 8 millimeter film that somebody I know took. Oh. Kids playing on the sculpture in front. Now, I could have been in this photo, I'm not, but I did help to sand the, the uh, seating structure inside the plenary hall, which is Hangar 5. And it was amazing that you couldn't keep kids off the, off the, the site. And Al said at one point um, that he had so many child helpers that the guys, the big tradesmen who you saw in the other pictures, were sometimes just sort of standing there moving like this because all, they would make a cut and then some kid would be there sweeping it up so they could barely move and had to control it eventually. But um, all of the, the kids in the surrounding schools were sometimes brought down by their teachers as field trips or they came down after school. And uh, they, since the, the rough wood um, seats were, were just that, they were rough and, and needed to be hand sanded, a huge army of people came down at the end to sand and, and I did my share of that myself. And that's what the structure looked like before the, the uh, tops went on. They thought of everything. The acoustics uh, were echoey, obviously, in an old hangar, and you had speakers, and you had the Vancouver Symphony coming down to play, you had musicians, and they were worried about uh, echo and um, in the fact that the, the talks might be inaudible. So Bill Reed designed a massive banner, large, a, design that, a banner that would be large enough to actually cover the entire ceiling. This is just, I, I don't know how many square feet that is, but it's, it's probably um, 150 feet by 100 feet. And it took 12 people to put it up, to, 12 people to carry it in and then a cherry picker to put it up, took them a couple of days, produced a beaut, and it, it also meant that the bright um, sodium lights that hung from the ceiling would be um, sort of softened because they hung above it. That was the process of putting it up. It's now disappeared. No one knows. Uh, the, the federal government came and, and uh, took it away at the end because they technically owned everything. Um, uh, but now say they don't have it, so it's a big mystery where it went. But this gives you a sense of just how beautiful the woodwork was and the joinery and the, the sheer sort of artisanship of that structure, that interior of the plenary hall, Hangar 5. 
And this is, the, this is the hangar where all the major speeches took place when they weren't taking place outside. And that's what it looked like. So you can see the banner above. And then the windows were covered just so they filter the light with um, banners made out of recycled material. And then you had hand-sewn pillows and, uh, and this deliberately informal seating structure. It was a stunning room. For those who remember, I'm sure you'd agree, for those who were there. And that's what it looked like full. You see a grand piano down there. There's the, uh, a, a concert setting. I'm not sure what concert this was. This is a Vancouver Sun photograph. Sorry, it's so dark. Um, the, it's not, uh, the projector's not on very bright, brightly today. But you get a sense of the sheer number of people you could actually fit in that room behind there. And it's blown out. But you can see freighters. So those lines at the top in the window, in the, op in the open spaces, the, the sliding doors have opened to make these two openings. And you, you're seeing the, 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 the um, railing, and the, the ocean, the mountains, and the, the freighters. It was a stunning concert hall. And uh, it's, uh, it's something that those of us who actually remember Habitat, it's, this, is, this is the building that is the, the, the most tragic to us who were there. Um, and I, I think I'm still mourning, mourning that, the experience of being in there. This was one of the bigger hangars, um, slightly less attractive building, but as, as um, I was asking an architect friend of mine, what do you think architecturally about those buildings at Habitat? Were they... Were they worth saving? And he said, "Well, you, you know, you, it's it, you have to you have to break down what is architectural value. Sometimes the value of a building is not just its outside aesthetics, but it's the habits that a community builds up around uh, around that building. It's the memory of what took place in that building, and that's how you that's how you decide value. But even if you don't think it's an attractive building, it still had these absolutely incredible historic um, beams and posts." This was a, the longest stand-up bar in the world. It was an entirely handmade out of mostly yellow and some red cedar. And uh, it was one of the reasons why the site was so popular. And I actually believe Trevor had, uh, was the bartender, was one of the bartenders while in architecture school. <laughs> Everybody wanted a job at Habitat. Um, so this is what the social center or bar looked like. And uh, anybody who knows Sophie's Cosmic Cafe, sh uh, they had a the souvlaki stand down there. And they um, produced an unbelievable amount of food for, for um, the thousands and thousands of people who visited every day. So I'm just going to quickly go through this. This is one of the much larger hangars. So this would have been the exhibition hall, which is hangar eight, eight and setting up some of the exhibits. This is the boat that was used, came over from Nanaimo with a guy named Doug Blatoski, and he, he uh, salvaged logs with that, the gopher. I'm just going to quickly go, and this was the ferry dock, so you, you could uh, arrive from both West Vancouver and other parts of the city by boat, by Habitat Ferry, and that's what it looked like entering the site. And, uh, we are out of time, I think, so I'm going to quickly go over this last part, but the... Um, when Habitat was over, it was about 1978, uh, the Parks Board was bent on removing all five of the hangars. There was considerable opposition from City Council. And it raged on, as this article suggests, for quite a while. Um, Jack Volrich in particular, who wasn't um, mayor yet, who was an alderman, was really adamant that they stay. The whole point... Um, in people like Al Clapp's mind and, and, and the mind of others for refurbishing them for Habitat was in order to, to, to make an argument for their preservation for public and community use for the city of Vancouver and, and the people of Vancouver. Um, many groups agitated that they not be torn down. But one very early foggy winter morning, there was a fire just a few days after the fire alarm had been disconnected for maintenance and and it went down uh, but a month later a second one went down and after that uh, the parks board just got their way despite the fact that they had been told not to knock the buildings down did actually knock the buildings down all three remaining ones and I think, you know, people were exhausted after Habitat, the, the crew. Um, they, they tried to mount an effort to save them, but it, they, they just, uh, it, it was just, the parks board was just unstoppable. And um, May Brown in particular really wanted them down. They wanted to turn the park into, you know, they wanted, they didn't want buildings on parkland. 
and they didn't want to maintain the buildings. They, d they, they really didn't like the fact that one of them had been turned into an artist studio. There were hippies there. The neighbors were, although the neighbors fought, fought for the, the preservation of the buildings, in the end, and it's a very long story we don't have time for, um, in the end they came down. And this, these are just some shots of the demolition. There's the Bill Reed mural on its way to coming down. And that's what it looks like today. That was during the time when they took the, uh, took the, the and, and, and now we have a new plan to ecologically restore the beach. Personally, I think it's fine. And, uh, and the remaining apron, the, the wharf, um, wasn't really serving that much purpose, and I'm not opposed to it, but it's, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that we lost those buildings. People kept saying, Are you, aren't you upset that they're taking the wharf down? It's like, well, not really, because the, what's, what, what was really valuable has already been lost. Um, but I want to end on a positive note, and that is just that the, the, the legacy of Habitat is, lies not in the buildings. As you can see, the site is rather empty. And, and very little is left, and uh, a couple of plaques aren't really going to help. But the, the, the legacy is in, I think, trying to resurrect the memory of it so that we understand the, um, the, the value of preserving history by preserving buildings. One of the, it, it is very difficult to, um, to understand history or to, without the buildings to mark them. You, in order to in, in, um, generate historical consciousness and historical memory in a place, it's much easier to do if the buildings in which it took place are, are actually still standing. And uh, I think that is an important lesson, but I also think that, that you know, the, the, the idealism of that time and Vancouver's um, position globally as a place for innovation and new ideas, for um, ideas of social justice, ideas about housing and settlement, um, innovation in terms of environmental solutions, and, and a kind of positive energy and, and uh, people coming together to actually do things in a, in a kind of a non-bureaucratic way in many ways. I mean, I mean, children were involved in that site. I it probably wouldn't be allowed today because of insurance. But you know, I asked Al at one point, "Why we? Why did you? Why were there children involved in that?" And he said, "Well, I, he just he didn't understand the question." And he said, "Well, I, di I didn't see any reason to keep them out." Uh, I, I think that there are many lessons in, um, to be learned from this. And you know, those people, the, the buildings might not be there, but the people who were involved in Habitat were there and have gone on to do extremely interesting things. I guess Trevor is one of them. And um, the, the many designers, for example, Gavin Froome, who gave me that, uh, um, the Habitat stamp has, is the director of Coast Modern Film about Vancouver and West Coast architecture that was screened at the Venice Biennale for Architecture this summer. Um, Robert Studer, who, the, the well-known designer, all of these people have said that they probably wouldn't be doing what they're, w today what they're doing had it not been for their experience at Habitat. So it's there, um, but, I, I, so I, but I, I think the value of resurrecting the history of this event is to, f partly for its own sake, but also as a, as a spur to, um, f if not future activities of this kind, then at least to uh, some kind of thinking about uh, preservation of of the, the, what we do have left of our history in Vancouver. So I don't know if there's time for a Q&A now. It's, it's probably getting very late. Uh, but thank you very much for your attention through that very long 150 slide slideshow. I really appreciate that you're coming. Thank you very much, uh, Lindsay. Um, we have uh, time for about 15 minutes for questions, discussion. So we are uh, recording, so it'd be great if you could speak into the microphone. Now I can see you. Yes. It's much uh, nicer. Just a couple of quick comments. Uh, I think I was about 18 or 19 during that, and I was there on a couple of occasions. Um, uh, and just a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, virgin timber from uh, Douglas Fir from Jerry's Cove was used in the reconstruction of the Imperial Palace in China at the turn of the century. Wow. And that gives you an idea of the history. Um, second of all, there's a, an entire story that predates Habitat that relates to the site, which is closely connected to its destruction by the Parks Board. And the current 
nature of the site that you describe so well as a kind of a wasteland is encapsulated in an edict from the Parks Board at the time of the demolition, and it's five words, Jericho will always be green. Making it, in my opinion, the first example of greenwashing in Vancouver. <laughs> and um, the fire, uh, if you look at the historical published reports, there was a death in one of the hangars, a tragic death a few days before the fire and ultimate bulldozing of Bill no, Reed's sculpture. If I can just uh, intervene, it was actually in 1974. Well, uh, Unless there's what, another one that I don't know about. I'm giving you a hint, and the other one is a teaser. Uh, there is a reason the Parks Board wanted to destroy everything and level the buildings, and it actually was before, I think, Habitat was conceived that leads to that. So. Thank you. Other questions? I, it would be great if Trevor would say something about his experience uh, yeah, there. Leslie, what a terrific project. And, and you haven't said much about how you're going to pull it together and, and package it, um, you know, I think. Uh, well, yeah, that's a whole other. What are the current plans? It's, uh, well, it's going to be a book. But as you know, when you're um, doing nonfiction, you work with a publisher. So, and I don't want to jinx anything right now. So uh, that's in progress. Um, I think you were getting into interesting terrain at the end there, and of course with time, probably couldn't get into it, but the kind of ideological and cultural reading of Habitat is pretty interesting. I mean, to map it against, I think, I think it, it's one of the great counterculture events. It's up there with Woodstock and the first Rainbow Gathering, etc., cetera, and, and that cut both ways, right? That's, the, it was the hippie workforce and, and the links to First Nations. This is the most significant... First Nations presence in the city in a century. So, you know, I know, which I didn't have time to yeah, deal with. So, you know, it's really interesting. Um, you know, your last chapter could be The Hippies Were Right, because so much there recycling, you know, you go through the issues, the agenda there, and then you map it against a kind of um, liberal political situation, you know, with strong support from the top. And then you fast forward 10 years later to. Um, Expo 86, which is ideologically completely different, right wing, driven by uh, you know coal mining, transportation industries, etc., that kind of corporate agenda, completely different ideological event, and then uh, almost the saddest of them all is 30 years later with the World Urban Forum. People don't even know that on the 30th anniversary there was a world gathering of the same. Well, program. and 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 how do you explain that? Uh, well, well, that it, program it was really quite sad in a way because there was no intellectuals, there's no Margaret Meads, there's no talks, there was no architects, there's no city planners. It was an NGO confab and, and politicians. So the kind of industry of NGOs. Very uh, much, it did seem very professionalized, bureaucratized. Yeah. It, it, was, it was the a antithesis of, of Habitat. No, it, it was unbelievable. I remember there's one session where uh, they had a BBC television presenter with 1,300 people in the room. And he said, oh, let's get the private sector perspective on that idea. Anyone. And in 1,100 people in the room, there's not one person from the private sector in the entire room. It was an NGO fest. So it's very sad to see it going from utopian counterculture optimism and with the, the, the kind of after affairs, the 10th and the 20th, um, the 30th anniversaries, um, becoming so much less. I think, I hope you, you, you do a... A final chapter. I, uh, that I talks am going to look the, at this about the, the legacy because I think it's fascinating. But well, I mean, it's um, you know, and, and you have to also question why you, you know the the discussion has been ratcheted so far to the right politically that you now have a top UN economist whose work now reads entirely radical. And this was relatively mainstream in 1976. If you read the Vancouver Declaration, it sounds like a radical manifesto. But it's not actually, you read it, it's actually quite sensible she, it, and prescient, I think. Um, it's largely Barbara, it was communally written, but it's largely Barbara Ward's thoughts. And it's, you know, she's, she's saying very simple things like, you, you know, we're going to be in trouble if this, if this unequal distribution of wealth goes any further. And I'm very, I mean, fast forward to today and it just sounds, I mean, it sounds like Occupy. 
Uh, and I, you know, by it's very uh, Expo to me was a very surreal experience because it felt as if more time should have elapsed for so much change to have taken place. It was so absolute. The city was so different by then. It's, you know, I really think the '70s were in some ways an intellectual golden age in terms of the the uh, the innovation and the hopefulness and and yes, counterculture, but also just the sheer um, sort of global concern. Uh, that people had at this time and, and Greenpeace was being launched at the same time which your point is taken about that site being used for multiple Greenpeace launches I think it probably uh, did help to seal its fate but uh, just a quick question before Mike goes on somewhere else I mean maybe it's for your mom as well I'm just curious about West Side residents attitude to the retention of the hangers I know yes some wanted them for arts related pump public Functions and that was the kind of May Brown debate, but I also got the impression that a lot of West Side uh, uh, residents did not like them. It was again associated with counterculture. It was messy. Um, it was not what they wanted to further their real estate prices. So I, I, I'm just curious about the micro community post habitat reaction. It's a bit hard to track. Um, and I, I don't know if my mom actually remembers. I don't think she does. Um, but uh, from looking at what data I have um, or um, accounts I have, uh, people on the west side in the nicer houses were actually the ones out at those meetings trying to protect those. It's a minority of those people who were who were arguing for them to come down. And I think you have to realize that it was the, the, the military and industrial um, history of that site meant something to those people. They themselves had um, family members who flew out of that who flew out of that base. I mean, everybody had a connection to it. And I, I think that that's part of it. There were definitely some direct neighbors who probably didn't think it would. But, you know, of course, my answer to that is, well, <laughs> fix it, you know, fix them up. Take, take four of them down or take three of them down. You don't need to keep them all, perhaps. Maybe there wasn't enough money in the parks board, but you could easily have, have saved one. I mean, it would, have, it would be a world-famous, world-class, I hate that term, but we use it anyway, um, performance. You could use it as a, it could be multi-purpose. You could have um, farmer's markets in there. You could have kids playing tennis in there on a rainy day. You could have con VSO, I mean could have been used for anything. And I think people like that knew that. And had you fixed them up and had proper security and made them lockable, uh, you know, it, it would have... But there was no talk of that because the Parks Board didn't want that type of park. Any other questions? I just wanted to, I just wanted to comment as someone that grew up just up the hill from Jericho. Uh, that beach was not a public beach. It was fenced off. And it was a military base. And I remember when somebody went and cut the link, okay? And there was a little outhouse-sized building for something called surfboarding on the, on the east side of the fence. And I remember when the fence was cut and we as kids went through the fence for the first time and eventually, after a lot of politics, it became an open beach. And the reason the Jericho Sailing Center survives is because the sailors dragged their boats in front of the building and blockaded the bulldozers, okay? And there's, a, there's an entire history that, that goes on with this. And so if you look, you can find a newspaper picture of that little outhouse with something called a surfboard. And it, it's a really an amazing I, story. Yes, I've seen them. Just yeah. one, one last remark on that, and that is that uh, I, I feel I need to say, because they are really adamant to say it, that that is a, a democratic sailing center. It's not, people call it the sailing club, or, but it's actually like a, it, it, and it retains that bec partly because of the parks board, but partly because of habitat. That's for a sailing club, for a sailing center for everybody. And they, um, the uh, head there, Mike Cotter, was at Habitat. And about a year ago, somebody came into his office and said, I have something for you. And a 12-year-old, when Habitat was over, climbed the flagpole that was on top of the building, stole the flag, and it had it in his basement this whole time, and he brought it back. So they have it. If you want to see the original flag from the sailing center, it's that. And uh, it's in Mike's office. Uh, 
That's amazing. It's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi, Andy. Hey, Lindsay. I was curious, would you ever see it as a possibility of recreating one of those hangars in that space? This is my deepest desire. I think one of the reasons I actually want to write this book, not just because it has personal significance, and I'm also I think it has significance for Vancouver that most Vancouverites don't know anything about, but I, I, I am hoping that it would spark that. Because what's really interesting is that uh, every time I talk to somebody about this, people say, well, why don't they just rebuild one of those? But the problem is the current Parks Board plan, I know this is being recorded and I don't... Um, I, with respect to the Parks Board, um, their current plan is pretty suburban. It's not, it's underwhelming. It's a very important site for the city of Vancouver. It's very central. It's visible from everywhere. It, they could have done something bloody amazing. And it's not that hard. These are simple buildings. It would not be that hard to remake one of those. My Gavin Froome, the, the architecture filmmaker who, who gave me that stamp, was the first thing he said when he saw my photographs. Actually, the first thing he said was, oh my God, this is like seeing photos of the Sasquatch. <laughs> because it's, that's how forgotten it is. That's how obliterated the history is. Um, but the second thing he says is, let's raise a million dollars and force this, but you'd have, to talk, you'd have to force the parks board because that's the land it would be on. And if you go to that site now and you, or you look at those, those uh, aerial photographs, <laughs> there's nothing there. You know, it's, not, it's not as if they tore them down in order that they could do something on that spot. Yeah. Uh, the, it's, it's a bunch of brambles. That's, that space, there's so much space there, it could easily support one more hangar, even at a slightly smaller scale, it would still be massive. And, and, and that Bill Reed mural needs to go back. Yeah. They are, all the foundations are still there. You can actually, between the two big trees between hangars, five and six, there's a wedge of concrete that they can't get out. And it's just stuck there in the roots. It's come, kind of coming up. But yeah, I mean, I, I, and I think in terms of um, the First Nations component of that hangar, uh, you know, that is Coast Salish land. So is this. And, uh, you know, I, th I think there needs to be, there could be an amazing hybrid building there in recognition of its m multifarious history. I just wanted to say uh, thank you very much, Lindsay. That was, that was incredible, and uh, we're looking forward to the book uh, coming out. So thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, I do want to, I have one quick thing to say. I just want to dedicate this talk to my friend Patrick Reddy. He's here. This was him blowing the cork, the cork off a bottle of champagne when they completed Hangar 5. They completed ha Habitat days before the conference. He died a month ago. He was a huge help in my research, and I just wanted to dedicate this to him. I found this two days ago only in, in CBC footage, and there's the, there's the champagne. So it's for Patrick. Thank you very much.